Hello, uh, in this video we'll be looking at cryptanalysis. So if you missed the explanation on it, let's go over it. Well, what is cryptanalysis? Well, the objective to recover key, not just the message, right? Um, so what cryptanalysis do is evaluate what kind of crypto systems we're working with and see how secure it is or how to go about cracking it pretty much, right? So the general approach uh, to brute force attack, which is trying to, um, well, trying every single possible combinations on what kind of keys uh, that it uses and cryptanalytic attacks. So the brute force attack nowadays for modern ciphers are pretty much impractical. It cannot be done feasible within the you know reasonable amount of time. So people use cryptanalytic attacks, things like rainbow attacks. What is a rainbow attack? Have a look at Google's. Yeah, um, I will explain it later anyway. <laughs> um, so let's have a look at brute force attack first. Um, we want to try every single possible way, and if we do that, actually one of them will be the solution, right? Uh, this is very simple to develop uh, as well. Um, you know, just chuck it into a loop where you try every single key combinations. Um, success rate proportional to the key size. Um, and exactly how long does it take depending on the key size? Let's have a look at on the table. Okay, assume a known or recognized plain text is also needed uh, for this to work anyway, uh, by the way. So keep that in mind. So this one, uh, key size 56, uh, if you remember, is from DES. Right, so if we are trying to brute force DS of key size 56, this is uh, roughly um, 2 to the power 56, um, which is 7.2 times 10 to the power 16. Right, so if you can do one decryption per microsecond, um, it will take about 1142 years. Yeah, I'm sure we can wait for that, but. Um, if we can do, say, 1 million decryptions per microseconds, um, that's down to 10 hours. So as the technology advances, cracking them using brute force is actually getting faster and faster. Uh, but we do have to note that uh, technology doesn't, doesn't get that fast that quickly. So for example, the AMD chip that was back in 2017, uh, was able to do 300,000 instructions per second. Um, but also, decryption is more than a single instruction. It's compound of multiple instructions at the same time, which means it's still going to take a long time to crack. And especially when we're using AES, which has the minimum key size of 128, already you can see that um, the number of years has increased dramatically. Okay? So brute force attack um, in modern systems is um, pretty much not possible. Okay? So cryptanalytic attacks are the ones that are trying to deduce information based on what you have. Okay? So there's a few different stages to it. The first one is you only have ciphertext only. The, this one is you actually literally have nothing else. Okay? So only knows the algorithm and the ciphertext. Nothing else, which means there's a lot more to do uh, from this. Known plain text, uh, this allows you to uh, select a plain text and you can get a corresponding ciphertext. This is actually uh, much more useful in that sense. You can have a chosen, chosen plain text, which means you can specify exact uh, plain text you want to um, encrypt and then you can get a corresponding ciphertext. So, so the chosen plain text, uh, in sense, you can choose like some uh, common words like the, which appears a lot. So that means uh, it's much easier to identify where they might appear. Okay? Um, chosen ciphertext means uh, when you select a ciphertext, uh, you are able to retrieve uh, its corresponding plain text. Okay? And the combinations of the above two uh, both ways, just don't know the key, okay? So if we convert that into scenarios, our worst case is we know the ciphertext only, so we only know a bunch of Cs, um, but most time, we will assume that they have been generated by the same key, otherwise it's 
finding a needle in a haystack pretty much. Um, so the objective in this particular case will be to retrieve the plain text, also retrieve the key, and um, identify the algorithm that converts C to P, the decrypting algorithm. So we, we know the encryption, but we don't know the decryption. Um, once we can achieve those three objectives, then we can compromise the uh, crypto system. Okay. But in practice, um, this is a very difficult thing to do. But this is the order that you will try to achieve. So get the plain text first, and then get the key, and then find out the algorithm. Okay. So once you have a known plain text, um, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, it's already provided, but the attacker cannot select these pairs. Um, so the attacker doesn't have any um, control over it, but it does reduce the single step, which was finding the plain text. Okay? So once you know this, then it becomes cracking the key. So this is kind of the attacks that we were talking before, where uh, attackers have some knowledge about some plain text that are matching to some ciphertext. Then in order for the attacker to crack the rest of the ciphertext, they need to identify the key. Okay? In a chosen plain text, what happens is the attacker can select the plain text before the attack begins uh, and cannot gain additional pair after the attack started. Okay? So similar to the previous um, scenario, but this time I can select which one, whereas previous one you're already given what you work with. So the previous case will be something like you have intercepted some message um, and you already know uh, some plain text um, that will always uh, carry. Uh, for example, in World War II, there is the Germ German soldiers always had a message that will uh, end with Heil Hitler, right? So you can always correspond that um, ciphertext uh, to Heil Hitler. So that's uh, one that you can you already given. But in this instance, you can actually choose different words or different phrase that will corresponding to ciphertext. So this makes it a little bit easier. Um, we can be, which can be combined with some previous approaches. Okay? So the chosen ciphertext, uh, in this instance, the attacker can select ciphertext before the attack begins. Okay? And then you are able to retrieve its corresponding plain text. Okay? So this means you have a more intel about uh, how the ciphertext and plain text are matched together. So your objectives are still the same, but um, you have a better understanding of what plain text and ciphertext are because uh, this attack you can always select ciphertext uh, based on plain text. So it means the generator is public. So this apl applies to public key systems when you're trying to attack them. Okay. But we will look at the public key system uh, in the uh, next few videos. Okay. So this is the last, um, the most knowledgeable one, but you can see that the objectives are still the same. So essentially, securing your key is the utmost importance uh, when it comes to uh, designing a very good uh, cryptographic systems. Okay. Uh, previously, I talked about rainbow tables, and this is where it can be quite useful. Um, what rainbow table is is pretty much a collection of common words that are potentially used for like keys or passwords. So for instance, you know that um, password is eight characters long, uh, but it's not going to be something like A, 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 or B, 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 something like that, but uh, rather something probably resembles like words or something that's uh, closely related to the user, okay? So let's have a look at the result of attack. Um, there's a few different stages uh, of the result after the attack happens. The total break is when you lose the key. Uh, if you lose the key, the attacker is able to decrypt all the ciphertext and retrieve all the uh, plain text. And that's not uh, what we want. Okay? So that is the main goal. We don't want to lose the key. And there is a whole area of key management which I don't really get into in this uh, lecture. Okay. Um, but otherwise, uh, the next stage is global deduction. Okay. So the attackers could not find the key, but they were able to find the algorithm. Okay. 
which means uh, if they're given a lot of time to work on it, they will eventually be able to uh, retrieve plain text uh, by means of brute force or any other cryptanalytic methods. Okay. Uh, in the um, instance of deduction, uh, obtain some plain text from ciphertext, but the attackers did not find out the key or uh, the algorithm, which means there is a very less low chance that when the ciphertexts are leaked, they are able to retrieve the plain text of them in the future. Okay. And the last level is information deduction. Uh, obtained partial bits of plain text, so even not even a whole plain text of a blocks, but only a partial bits of block. Okay. So, so those are the four different levels of um, results that we may talk about uh, when crypto systems are attacked. Okay. So based on those we can measure some secureness of ciphers. And this, uh, these uh, can be used to uh, label which ones are secure or not. Okay? So computationally secure means uh, cost to break is higher than cost to encrypt. Okay? So our encryption cost should always be less than the cost to break. Okay? Uh, also, time taken exceeds the useful lifetime. So as we've seen in the table previously, taking thousands of years, um, will fall into computation as secure. Okay? And many of the um, encryption algorithms falls into this. Okay? Provably secure, so you've probably seen this in our uh, cipher modes, uh, talking about counter modes. Well, this is the security mechanism can be proven to be equivalent to a hard problem. So when we say hard problem, you probably heard about MP hard problems, so that's what we're trying to map back to. Okay? So if it can be solved and matched to those hard problems, then we say that that's probably secure. Okay? And the best um, security level you can achieve uh, for ciphers is unconditional security. This means the attacker cannot succeed in cryptanalyzing the algorithm given an infinite amount of resources. Okay? So no matter how strong your computer is, how many time you have, you are unable to analyze uh, the crypto system. And the only ciphers that are known to be in this category is a one-time pad. Okay? One-time pad uses randomness uh, when uh, it's trying to encrypt. For example, you have stream of bits, which is your original message. And uh, we need to apply uh, XO with zeros or one, but these zeros or ones should be generated randomly. So that means, for example, uh, you boil the water and count how many bubbles you observe um, every 10 seconds, for instance. Okay, so that's very random. Or you go to um, aquarium and then um, you count the number of dots on each fish uh, where there's a thousands of flooding around and each fish can be used for XO with uh, each bit. Okay? That can be quite random too. Okay, so any of naturally occurring randomness uh, can be regarded as random and can be used to a uh, use for one time pad. But what is the problem with one time pad? You may have guessed it, right? Um, the one time pad usually to encrypt the full length of uh, plain text, you need equivalent length of randomness observed. Okay? And often in a symmetric key cipher, we have to provide this key to both the sender and the receiver. So next question is, how can I send this key to the receiver? We need to use a different cipher <laughs> system. Hence, uh, this is a recurring um, issue. So uh, yeah, that's why one time pad, uh, although idea is great, um, but because it has a high randomness into it, often it is very difficult to share this, uh, this uh, key uh, with the group. Okay, um, so that's why it's sometimes very difficult to implement in practice. Anyway, so that's the end of um, symmetric key cipher encryption systems, encryption decryption systems. Um, yeah, next video we'll move on to public key systems, looking at RSAs and DH. Alright, bye!